Hi, it's Lee, and welcome to The Tesla Economist. Now, I'm sorry if you've had enough of me talking about batteries, but the more I come to understand what the 4680s have achieved, the more it impresses me and adds to my conviction on the stock. I try and explain my findings as best as possible to you, and as to what it means to the company or stock price. Even to this day, I'm still getting my head around the breakthrough technology in Tesla's 4680 sales. I've said before, it's like an onion with layers and layers of information. Although I felt like I was getting close to the core by now, but with people starting to do teardowns on the sales and hearing more information from 4680 Model Y owners, more ideas are starting to percolate inside my head. I wanted to discuss some of these latest ideas to establish even further just how amazing this cell is and what it means compared to the alternatives. Firstly, when it comes to batteries, there's always some sort of compromise in everything. For example, cost. You can have iron phosphate cathodes at much lower cost than nickel, but then you sacrifice energy density. There are trade-offs everywhere. You want more power, then you lose range. You want faster charging speed, then you get more degradation. You want silicon for more energy density, then more degradation too. Of course, battery safety matters too. For example, a pouch battery can be lighter than a prismatic, but we saw the issues that GM ran into with those. The trick is finding the right balance for the right application. For manufacturing too, if you want an easier cell to manufacture, then use prismatic, but the reduction speed is slower, and that is where Tesla differ from everyone else. They're attempting much more complex manufacturing techniques to give these advantages at finding sweet spots everywhere, for example, Tesla is still able to get exceptional power without sacrificing range too much. Other than that, there really hasn't been any major breakthroughs since the initial lithium ion battery was first invented. Perhaps adding silicon might have been. There tends to be somewhat of a narrative that people think that battery technology will simply improve and perhaps every year energy density will improve 5% or something and that legacy will eventually catch up to where Tesla are today and then be able to have a more even playing field. But no, this is kind of it. We pretty much have to work with what we've got until that 4680. I think the 4680 has actually made some serious breakthroughs. These breakthroughs give Tesla a massive lead. However, it's not so much the breakthroughs themselves that have reduced costs and improved energy density. It's more that they've allowed Tesla to be able to rethink the battery from first principles. The two breakthroughs I'm mainly referring to are dry battery electrode process and tablet design. Due to these two breakthroughs, it allows more creativity in design due to not being held back so much with things like thermal management. Something that Jordan from The Limiting Factor discovered during his teardown of the 4680 cell was that the electrodes were about 20 to 25% thicker than the 2170 cell. I've been thinking more about this and starting to realize exactly what it means or what it means for now until we discover another level. And that's kind of how genius these cells are the way it keeps coming together on more and more levels to understand just what Tesla have done here. However, having thicker electrodes, well, think about it. What does it mean? It means there's gonna be more electrode in the cell relative to everything else. In other words, there's less aluminum, copper, and separator required in the cell relative to actual energy capacity. All these elements that are not contributing anything to the power of the cell, yet they still cost something and they still weigh something. Any density of a cell is all about how many ions you can fit in. Lithium is such a great element as it's very light and a small atom. So more lithium ions can fit into a cell compared to other elements. This is why the lithium ion battery has done so much for technology. It all comes down to how many ions you can fit into the cell. And like we discussed, the silicon before in the anode can take on more ions, but it expands too much. Whereas graphite is much more durable and cells like 2170 use a graphite anode with only a little bit of silicon, perhaps under 5%. The same with the cathode, iron cathodes not able to take on as many ions as nickel. Anyway, using a thicker cathode and anode means there is more relative electrode within the cell, which would obviously mean there can be more lithium inside too. But like we said, more of the other elements are not required. For example, the separator does not need to be any thicker. Therefore, a thicker anode and cathode means better energy density and fewer other elements required, thus reducing cost. How is this achieved though? Well, we know that the cathode is still not using the dry battery electrode process, so that's not the reason. It's due to thermal management. As the electrodes are thicker, it means that ions have further to travel, which could create thermal management issues. 
But that's the whole point of the tabless cell. It's so brilliant as it's like there is a tab everywhere for the cell and thus can travel at such shorter distances and not create thermal management issues, thus resulting in thicker electrodes and more energy density. This might be why we're hearing 4680 cells may have similar energy density to 2170 already, even though 2170 is using silicon and 4680 is not. And some reports have said that the 4680 may even have more energy density than the 2170 cell. Perhaps the thicker electrodes make that much difference, along with the other magic in a 4680, like the dry battery electrode process. Now, yes, although Tesla have not supposedly quite sussed the dry battery electrode process for the cathode yet, at least at higher production rates, we have seen it for the anode and had teardowns of it. Also, just a side note, it sounds like the anode would have actually been harder to achieve as a dry battery electrode than the cathode too, which is possibly a good sign. In addition to that, there isn't the usual binding required with the dry technique when compared to the wet slurry technique. This improves conductivity and energy density more as well. I can't go into too much detail about that as I don't understand it well enough yet, but I'm still researching more continually and doing my best to understand what Tesla are doing with their cells so I can explain the economics. Now we already understand the tablet design also allows Tesla to produce larger cells, i.e. five times more volume than 2170. I've gone over this a lot, so I won't go into too much detail, but it means that larger cells need less casing relative to electrode or jelly roll. So you have a lighter cell relative to energy capacity and you can produce them faster on the production line with fewer welds and processes. Now, we also know that structural packs mean lighter weight and improved structure, resulting in better handling. Now, I suppose in theory, this is possible with cells with a smaller diameter too, i.e. not 4680, and thus not necessarily tabless either. But Tesla have done other clever things for safety in order for them to be structural, especially in the event of any thermal issues. Remember, the term structural pack gets thrown around synonymously with cell to vehicle integration, which is not the same thing. A structural battery pack is a battery that contains the structure inside the pack, whereas Tesla's 4680 cells are the structure. I also wouldn't have thought you could have cells to vehicle with prismatic. I think the structural integrity would be vastly superior with cylindrical, similar to a honeycomb structure, which is incredibly strong. There are more breakthroughs to come in the industry too. We potentially have solid state cells or graphene cathodes. Yes, carbon cathodes. They just need to work out how to produce them at mass scale at low cost. It feels like whoever can work out how to produce graphene at low cost mass market will probably be as rich as Elon Musk. Kind of like how Henry Ford was the richest man in the world producing an affordable car, like Elon producing an affordable EV. And then someone producing affordable graphene will be like Andrew Carnegie, who was also the richest man in the world from finding ways of mass producing steel. I hope I explained this somewhat well enough. I'm doing my best to understand it all. The better I understand it, the easier it will be to explain. I didn't come from a battery background. I came from business. But I think compared to other analysts who understand the business and finances, I have gone further than most into understanding how the actual batteries are working in order to truly understand Tesla's competitive advantage here that I can then articulate back into the business in order to really lay it back into is how valuable it is to the company, how much it helps with competitive advantage, cost and production capabilities in order to meet all that demand. But like I say, I currently think that when Tesla hit high volume production on 4680s, excluding FSD and other areas of the business, the stock price should triple sometime within a couple of years from there. Thanks for listening. Please hit the thumbs up and subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and talk to me on Patreon.